Ladies and gentlemen, please, I have something to smoke, I have something to drink, and I have a skunkle t-shirt on. This must be news, hound! So here we are, people. We're going to take a little trip. Uh, we're gonna, we've done already done one about Klaus Schwab, a news hand about Klaus Schwab. I think it was the second or third one I did called Klaus Schwab's First Time. And that looked at the first mention of Klaus Schwab that I found in the archives I had access to. But since then, I've got access to a couple of extra little bits, just a couple of extra, like, thousand newspapers or something, um, like a, a plus bonus pro uh, newspaper site that I, um, we've registered to. And so I thought I'd have another look, see if I'd find anything. So the last time it was about this article called Threat to Privacy, which was one of the first times Klaus Schwab's mentioned, but it's not actually one of the first times Klaus Schwab is mentioned. In actual fact, that article was from, I think, 1967, 1968, 1970 maybe, 19, between 67 and 70. I've got it on here as well. I think it's probably 70. And it's like about, I think that article is about four or five months before the first Davos, which is in um uh, January of 1971. And of course, that's a really important moment. It's the beginning of the World Economic Forum. And um, as keynote speaker is von Habsburg along with John Kenneth Galbraith and Herman Kahn's there. So there's a lot of big uh, people there. So this episode of New Count is going to look at the real first moment that Klaus Schwab is mentioned in the newspaper archives in 1962, which is while he's still um, a student. But this is just after he graduated from a university that I haven't found listed before in America. Klaus Schwab studied engineering in America. And I did not know this because I'd seen like the different European um, degrees he got. And what you've got to realize is that Klaus Schwab got a fair few degrees. He got honorary degrees as well, really early on, like special degrees where he only had to uh, like study for like six months in a place and suddenly he was given a full degree. So obviously they were, they were prepping him for a big, powerful position. They were wanted to be associated with him early on. And I think this will show that. But what we'll also do here, because that's just one piece, we're going to look at the first ever Davos and some of the newspaper um, stuff about the first Davos, which, we, of course, back then they weren't called the World Economic Forum. Klaus Schwab originally called it the European Management Symposium. That's because it wasn't supposed to show its globalist teeth until it was too late for anybody to do anything about it. Um, so Kissinger... Taught Klaus Schwab, for those who don't know, Kissinger taught Klaus Schwab uh, from 1965 to 1967 um, in Harvard uh, at the inter at Kissinger's International Seminar, which was funded by uh, multiple CIA conduits, three specifically, the American Friends of the Middle East, Asian Foundation, and um, the Farfield Foundation. And those three entities um, were the people who uh, were funded by the CIA, run by the CIA. I mean, I mean, American Friends of the Middle East, I think every member is probably a member of the CIA. Kermit Roosevelt, the head of the American Friends of the Middle East, was the person who, did, who organized, led, planned everything, the first two American coups in Egypt and Iran, respectively, in 1962 and 1963, respectively. Um, so these are really important, like monumental people, monumental times. Klaus Schwab, that was the first time that I thought he had gone to America. No, not so. So the in the last episode we did of Newshound, we looked at Elon Musk, and we discovered on his Zip2 website that Elon Musk had once worked for Microsoft, something that's never been said. I've never heard that said out loud. Never heard that he worked for Microsoft. But we found it on the archives going back 1997. Um, so th this is really good to go back to the beginning of people's careers, uh, these big players, and see what they're doing then. And see what they're like, get a, an idea of what the culture was like at the time and the politics and everything like that and the people they were dealing with. So we should do this. Let's do this. Let's do our news hand. Let's share the screen. I'm going to press buttons. 
and suddenly, boom, there you are, like magic. Uh, we'll get to that one. That one's a little bit later down the line. We're going to start off at the Shreveport or Shreveport Journal. I'm not sure which one you said. That's um, for Shreveport and Bozier City in Los Angeles. And this is for Monday, July 2nd, 1962. And here we go. This is the first mention of Klaus Schwab that I can find in a Western newspaper. It's 1962, so it's a fair few years before the one I previously thought was. And it's really interesting because his name, even though it's searchable here, here it doesn't come up as highlighted. Most of these, you'll, I'll go through this same archive where I'm going to show you a few things. It's quite a comprehensive newspaper archive. It's actually a newspapers.com, this one. Um, and this is really interesting because if you look at this, look, 202 students will receive degrees at Louisiana, Louisiana Tech. So, Louisiana Tech. Has anybody heard about Klaus Schwab ever studying at Louisiana Tech? Well, he did, apparently. Let's get the glasses on. Where are they? Oh, I got my temporary glasses because I've lost all my other ones. So I may look like a transvestite, but let's not, um, let's not quibble. These are just simple reading glasses. It says Ruston. That's the place where it's being reported from. Commencement will be held at Louisiana Tech on August the 2nd for 202 candidates for degrees. The graduates will give the college its largest group for a summer session. One year ago, degrees were conferred upon 189 students at Tech. At Tech. Among the present candidates are 65 seeking master's degrees and as compared with 53 who were listed for advanced degrees here last summer. The School of Education has reported 91 degree aspirants, which include 40 masters. The list of candidates by school is as follows. And so what they do is they show you all the different things. They show you agriculture, arts and science, uh, the master's degrees from Lebanon. don't know what that means. Uh, speech major, business administration. So all of these people here. But we're going to go and have take a quick look at Klaus Schwab, who's up here. There he is. Bachelor of Science in Petroleum Engineering. Klaus Schwab. Columbia S.A. See that? Columbia S.A. Columbia. That's very interesting. Um, Klaus Schwab, eh? Well, here is the engineering. So this Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering and all of those. And these are the degrees from Louisiana Tech. So Columbia, is this Columbia University in the city of New York that it's talking about? I think it may be. Um, and it's an Ivy League research university. So apparently, according to this, it says Columbia S.A. Klaus Schwab. So he's somehow related with that and that's really interesting okay so that's really interesting for those who want to know and understand the shreveport journal 1962 july the 2nd it says 202 students will receive degrees at louisiana tech and it says klaus schwab is getting his engineering degree the same degree that he got in multiple other places including in europe so it's really interesting here you go did you know that he went to Louisiana Tech and he was registered down as Columbia SA? That's very intriguing. Now, the next uh, newest, like I say, I did one of these before, mention of Klaus Schwab in the newspaper comes on the front page of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram on Friday, July 29th, 1966. So this is Four years later. Now, by 1966, Klaus Schwab is halfway through the this time. He's in America because Kissinger's International Seminar, which he intends, attends from 1965 to 1967, uh, is, of course, in America, in Harvard. And it's a summer school. It's not during turn time. So this is summer. He's in America. He's doing Harvard International seminar and he's mentioned that u2 plane missing search underway so the u2 spy plane stuff is about to kick off as well and 
if we go in here, right, we can see that on the front page it says, a young German scholar, Dr. Klaus M. Schwab, M starts for, stands for Martin, visited here recently. He has been traveling through the United States before doing graduate work in the fall at Harvard. So he's traveling through the United States. Now, here we go. Dr. Schwab's father, Eugen Schwab, the man who ran a Nazi model company, is a customer of Texas Refinery Corporation's headquartered here. Isn't that interesting? Klaus Schwab's father is a customer of Texas Refinery Corporation. Now, I didn't know that he was working in uh, petroleum or things like that. He was working in some sort of like trade organization this time, but maybe that's part of his job. He was heading up um, the uh, Ravensburg or Barton Wuttenberg trade organization, if I remember correctly. So, and the TRC, the Texas Refinery Corp, representative in Germany told Dr. Schwab he really wouldn't be seeing America unless he went to Texas. So he's obviously talking to the top people. So you, if your dad's at a company, that means you must be talking to him. But that doesn't make sense, does it? That's not the way it usually works. But in Schwab's case, he's following in the footsteps of his father, who run a model Nazi company called Escher Weiss during the war. So he's going in his footsteps. Now, the fuel that, that his father was once trying to develop was uranium enrichment, and that was for the Nazi atomic bomb program. So this is really interesting here, zoom, 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 that it mentions Klaus Schwab's father in 1966 being a customer at Texas Refinery Corps. Is that while he's still at Escher Weiss? Is that while he's still... Um, doing that sort of thing. And his actual Texas Refinery Corps is uh, actually a customer of Escher Weiss um, buying big turbines for refinery stuff because that's part of it, what they do. And at the end it says, so Dr. Schwab did went to Texas. While here, he fell into the company as such TRC people as Drake Bentall and Roy Tavender. Hmm, that's interesting. So it makes uh, a couple of mentions about people Meeting Swiss, not the aim. Dr. Schwab told him he decided to travel from New York to Texas by bus on the theory that he'd see more of the country, possibly meet more of the people. The young German got to the people meeting immediately. He sat next to an attractive young woman. He immediately struck up conversation. This is very interesting, but this is kind of the tone uh, um, the 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 uh, tempo and the tomb of um, articles from this day, 1966. You know, they like to throw in some quirky little bit about what's happening there. He began asking her questions about America. He was surprised that she didn't know more about the country. Uh, well, she was a useless eater, obviously. I mean, uh, as they talked, he tried to place her accent. It wasn't Southern, Midwestern, or Eastern. Could it be Northern? No. In actual fact, finally he asked where she was from. Her home, she told him, was in Switzerland. Ha! Huh. He discovered she'd come from a town just 60 miles from his home in Bavaria. Now, number one, he didn't live in Bavaria at that time. Um, so, the 60 miles... I don't think Bavaria is even 60 miles from the um, Swiss border. So I think if that's the case, they're probably talking about Ravensburg and they just said, oh, that must be in Bavaria because that's all we know. Uh, but it's actually in baden Württemberg. Now, if he does have houses in Bavaria, it's very interesting because it's never a leak place. But uh, he is from baden Württemberg. Uh, he is from um, uh, Ravensburg. But he did have a lot of connections with Switzerland because, of course, his father um, tried to get Swiss citizenship back after the war, after the risk that he could be called a war criminal. Tried to get Swiss citizenship back and de is denied because his Klaus Schwab's grandfather, Eugen Schwab's father, um, had once denounced his uh, German citizenship to go and move to Switzerland and then taken back up his German citizenship afterwards. Another reason why uh, Klaus uh, and his family back in the 50s were denied 
Swiss citizenship by the Swiss authorities. And later on, Klaus again applied for Swiss citizenship and was again denied. So it's a very interesting little story. And then it looks like it goes on to about gardening tips. It's like this little, nice little, huh, quick, quick story about Klaus Schwab there, just on the side. It's interesting that he makes the front page of this Texas newspaper. Very interesting he makes the front page. Well, that's what he does. He makes the front page. That's it. So the next one, we go three years later. Um, I wanted to mention this because uh, two of the mentors given to Klaus Schwab after he finished that Harvard graduate program there, that he was going through the international seminar, run by Henry Kissinger. So we're in the Boston Globe, Monday, January 6, 1969. Um, this, of course, Cambridge, Massachusetts is where um, Harvard is. And it says, Massachusetts men sought by JFK Nixon. And what this shows is the people who have come from Harvard, I believe this is what it shows anyway, and it's what it seems to explain. They come from Harvard that, is, that were wanted originally by the Kennedy team back in the day. Um, I suppose this is probably talking refer. Yeah, <coughs> it said JFK. I was rec referring to the people who served under JFK back in the day. And then um, some of the Nixon team. So you can see there's a lot of Harvard men. And one of the men on the Kennedy team, who was part of the Kennedy team, I mean, we've seen some of these names, but George Bundy was the person to first nominate, um, CFR member, of course, first person to nominate Kissinger for the CFR and persuaded him not to go to the FBI. Um, some of these names, like Rostow, Scheisinger, <laughs> Schlesinger Jr., um, very big names, very famous names. These are, are very big names, of course. Um, but John Kenneth Galbraith, of course, was part of Kennedy's team. Kind of Kennedy's team. He was brought in to actually uh, do a lot of the um, pre-election stuff. And then when he was elected, he was made ambassador to India. So he review, refused the first position. The first position JFK offered Galbraith was as ambassador to Moscow. You can't get a bigger ambassador, but that would be a really big role, and Galbraith wasn't interested in it. If you look down at the Nixon team, here we go, Kissinger's down there, Moynihan, Cabot Lodge, Marshall Green. You've got these other big names uh, mentioned for the Nixon administration. So this is just like the beginning of the Nixon administration. This is January 1969. So I think he got elected in December 1968. So he's about to be inaugurated oh, um, as pr president, I believe. But, you know, I know as much as I know about American history. And I like to think that I know a lot, but I also accept that sometimes, every now and again, I am wrong about something and I like to be corrected. I like to be told I'm wrong. If I am wrong, it is a rare thing. And often I know when I'm wrong, when I'm saying something, I go, is that something right? It's just like, you know how it is. Once you say something out loud, once you comes out of your mouth, you suddenly examine it in a different way than when you're just thinking it or when you're reading it, or all of those different things. You know, reading, thinking, um, and saying out loud are three different ways to um, look at information. They're three different tools for looking at information, and often you'll get different results from using each of those. I thought that was interesting in the Boston Globe, showing that there's obviously um, a massive link between um, Cambridge uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, as in um, as Harvard, and the people who are in power, especially during this time. So it's noted as well. Now, uh, a year later, this was appeared on the first article, the one I said, uh, Clash Schwab's first time, the first news hand I did a Clash Schwab, where he's talking about computers, uh, and some believe outrageously used for credit cards and investigations. Oh, wrong. 
Klaus Schwab says. Um, and I wanted to say this, and I wanted to put that, that was the original first mention that I really could find, was 1970, August 1970. Um, as you see, 1962 is much earlier. So 1966 and 1969, these are this this site's got a couple more. I think it's partially because it's got the Boston Globe stuff on there. Uh, let me just move a couple of these things around. Um, and let's get on to the next bit. Sorry, a little bit of organizing there. And here we go. We are about to read a new report that I haven't shown you yet, entitled Hot Air in Cold, Cold Climate. And this is from the Observer newspaper uh, on the 3rd of January, 1971. So, the European Management Symposium, the World Economic Forum, has been created. This is going to be its first year. January, Davos, it's this month. And a lot of people are trying to spread it around as being this new thing that's about to happen. But, they, you know, it's hard to get uh, involved. But this is a very interesting little article. For those who want to understand what the World Economic Forum is and where it's going, you have to understand where it started, who supported it, and who got involved. It's good to know. So, hot air in a cold climate. Interesting. Especially when environmentalism is one of the things that keeps coming up. And this Mammon article is a separate article, so ignore that. The cult of the management seminar is growing. So is the cost. Anyone with a finely developed sense of ridiculous will welcome the news that Davos, Switzerland, later this month, 500 of Europe's top businessmen will each pay about £700 to sit and learn at the feet of such mighty gurus as Herman Kahn and John Kenneth Galbraith, who I mentioned in, of course, Dr. Klaus Schwab or how the CFR um, taught me to stop worrying and uh, love the bomb. And and th these were the two mentors given by Kissinger to Schwab to go back and help uh, get some sort of traction, some sort of like pull for the big names to come in and be involved in this. And they did. These big names are being advertised. Such mighty gurus as Herman Kahn and John Kenneth Galbraith, as you see there. The first European management symposium organized by Geneva Business School, Centre d'Etudes, uh, industrial uh, to celebrate its 25th anniversary will cost each visitor £500 in registration fees, £100 for accommodation, plus travel, £53 fare from London. You can, of course, add a few pounds here and there for drinks and other sundries, which businessmen require when they're away from home. Yes, of course. Of course you can add it. So, so... What they've done is said like over seven hundred pound or seven uh, about seven hundred pound is what the, each of these business people will have to pay. But these that's why they're trying to attract the richer seven hundred pound back then. Um, uh, so, inflation calculator. Let's go check inflation calculator. Du, 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 du. Right, so here's an inflation cal a basic U.S. inflation calculator. So, in 1971, oh, if in if in 1971 I purchased an item for, ba, 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 I suppose you got to put it in here, seven hundred dollars, then in 2021. It would be five thousand one hundred and forty-five dollars. So basically, that ticket they they're saying, oh, it's an incredible rate if you want to go, and it's going to cost you loads of money. This, that, the other. It will. It will cost you over five grand, over five grand to attend the first ever World Economic Forum in today's money. So they're, they're talking here, and it seems like, oh, 500 quid, 600 quid. Ooh. But this is actually five grand just to hear 
uh, Gal Brave, Khan, and others speak, but you're not. You're networking on the highest level. This is the highest order. Okay. You can, of course, add a few pounds here and there, bloody bloody for sundries. It is a tribute to the leading business school that the huge um, talking will be a raging financial success. Not only is a two-week session the biggest and most expensive of its kind ever held, it has attracted a full house and a total revenue of 250000 But to be fair to the organisers, they are trying to deliver the goods by spending 200000 Okay, right. There's a few things I want to go over here. Firstly, this is how it was set up. Even though that this was um, a Harvard project managed and brought to fruition by Herman Kahn and John Kenneth Galbraith, like fought up partially by Kissinger and given to Schwab to set up um, to start. <coughs> this officially at the time, says it was organised by Geneva Business School Centre d'Etude Industrial, which is a central for industrial school, um, industrial studies. This, this isn't like quite so. This Geneva School is obviously a bit of a front for it, but I think Klaus Schwab had some form of... Um, interaction with these guys too some form of history with them and is the reason why now this interest and they say that it raised like so far they've raised two hundred and fifty thousand. okay so let's go back in time again two fifty thousand and calculate so they've raised the equivalent of 1.8 million in today's money so obviously this isn't like, this is quite a good deal anyway, but then that will allow them to run themselves. And I don't know how much of a cut Schwab took from that, but I bet you it was pretty hefty. And so they say they're spending 200000 so they're going to be spending like a, a million and a half of that sort of like Monday money um, on the event. And maybe, uh, but that means you could buy a building for that. Can you? Amazing. Amazing the money. So anyway, list of speakers reads like an international who's who. As well as Messrs. Khan and Galbraith, Jacques Maison Rouge, president of IBM World Trade Corporation, who part sponsored this. I mean, other places I've seen that IBM was a sponsor's. Some places I've seen IBM was a creator's. Now, here, you can't see what this name is. You see, it's been almost looks like it's been removed. Has that been removed? I mean, that's a bit strange, isn't it? What that says, I believe, is John Ray, R-E-Y, president of the European uh, Economic Community, are among the notab uh, notables who will be disseminating costly words of wisdom. Now, it's very interesting and very telling that... Uh, you look back in the archives and a name is missing, just one name in particular. We're very interested to see. Now, IBM uh, involved in a lot, of course. They supported the Nazis in the same way Klaus Schwab's dad did. So, I mean, they had the same. They also, uh, people like Elon Musk, as we learned in the last news hound, um, were partially uh, students of IBM or beneficiaries of IBM learning. For those who are not content simply to listen, management consultants, Erwick or are organizing a massive business game using four computers and six of their consultants. Straight away, computers, 1971, we're using these four computers and six of our consultants to play this massive business game. Now, it would be really limited, and I bet you we'd look at it now and go, what are they doing? But this is the start of the, the push for technocracy to be adopted by the rest of the world. Computers only just starting, and Klaus Schwab is on the head of as you've seen from that other, I uh, mean, before we looked at this inflation calculator, we were looking at this. And computers are widely, already widely, and some of you are So already there's uh, Klaus Schwab. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Hey, there we go. 
we'll get through it. Already, um, computers are really up front because it's about, like, you know, adopting technocratic ideas and adopting technology. If that isn't enough, there's always Ketna Trego. This famous course in problem solving has been adopted by many major companies in America and Europe and usually costs more than a hundred pound. Ooh, more than a hundred pound, which I suppose would be like um, 800 to, in today's money. Uh, Dr. Ben Trego will be putting a third of the students through 16 hours of training that is so grueling that the experience has been known to reduce participants to tears. Well, sounds like a good training course to me, especially if they're elites. Undaunted, senior managers from 40 British companies, including Glacier Metal, BP, British Leyland and Shell International, are going to Davos. So are the top 15, so are 15 top Japanese executives. Now, um, one thing you might not know is around this time, Harvard is uh, starting to get money from Japanese companies and Japanese governments to support certain programs within their legal studies department. So uh, Japanese studies happens within the legal studies department, I believe, in in um, Harvard soon and uh, around this time. As soon around, literally around this time, I think it is this year or the next year, um, they'll receive four million dollars in four separate donations. Uh, I think Mitsubishi, um, to Toyota, the Japanese government, and another company, I can't recall off the top of my head, another Japanese company, each give a million donation to Harvard. So I'm not surprised that the Japanese have something there. Now also, Kistra's international seminar saw not only Klaus Schwab trained as a future global leader, a few young global leader, but also a Japanese prime minister went through that program as well, who will be installed later on. So it's 15 top um, uh, Japanese executives, 20 Americans, half a dozen Israelis, and a sprinkling of Russians and South Africans. So they say at the end, you know, and, and the Russians and South Africans, whatever, whatever. But I mean, back then, having Russians as part is about bringing Russia to the table. And this was one of the reasons, because they needed, um, and again, I'll use the word conduits, to talk to each other, America. So there's a lot of that happening. And John Kenneth Galbraith is involved in a lot of this. There's a lot of these weird lectures uh, that are going on, a high level lectures that are going on with some Russian people at some of the universities around this time that include David Rockefeller and John Kenneth Galbraith and others being the American representatives. And the Russian side um, were a bunch of scientists. And this was like slowly they're realizing the rules of the game are changing and they don't want to go. Go through this whole thing anymore of uh, tempt, uh, tempting perpetual war. They're instead looking for another way out of the American, uh, the Cold War, really. Klaus Schwab, who is organizing the whole gigantic circus and lectures on management at the center, says it will be no holiday. Students will start work at 8 30 a.m. and go on until nearly midnight. They will uh, they will meet our learning objectives, said Schwab. If each top man comes back and makes an impact on the company as a result of his participation. Okay. So they will meet their objectives if each top man goes back and makes an impact on his company. What type of impact? Well, uh, networking impact and of course these big networking events will be like oh you went to this I went to this too <laughs> let's throw money at each other because we have loads of it while those plebs and useless users don't have any really interesting to see who's involved so there's a big British contingent by the side of 40 British companies were included so they obviously um, headed and looked at Britain and that might because be because of something I'm going to discuss later about John Kenneth Gow brave at the time because the same date as this article on the 3rd of January this was in the Observer this was in the Modesta B Modesto B I've chosen the Modesto B this was actually um, I think put up on a couple of places but this is Walter Scott's personality parade want the facts want to learn the truth about prominent personalities want informed opinion writes 
to Walter Scott Parade, 733 Third Avenue, New York, New York. New York, New York, 1017. Your full name will be used unless otherwise requested. Volume of mail received uh, makes personal replies impossible. So basically, this is a little bit, this is like this guy who talks about people who are famous. And here we go. John Kenneth Galbraith. It was a question. I have been told that economist John Kenneth Galbraith is seven feet tall and that he has uh, left the United States for good. Please confirm or explain Mrs. Robert Aldersey, Lexington, Massachusetts. And the answer says, economist Galbraith in 62 is six foot eight inches. That's true. He's a tall boy, a professor of economics at Harvard since 1949 widely read author of the affluent society and the newly industrial state or the new industrial state sorry president kennedy's ambassador to india galbraith is spending a year lecturing at trinity college cambridge university england plans to return to harvard so like i say why is there such a big british contingent because at the moment John Kenneth Galbraith is over there bringing people in. That's what he's been important, bring people into this new project and, and make it look like it's not necessarily American. Britain is the best way to do that. Galbraith is spending a year lecturing at Trinity College, Cambridge University, England, the plans to return to Harvard. Now think about this as well. Uh, it said the previous uh, a previous article said that Eugene Schwab, Klaus Schwab's father, was a company of this Texan petroleum company, and the majority of the people who are turning up for this, who who are they? The forty companies: Glacial Metal, BP, British Leyland, Shell International. A lot of these are petroleum companies. So was this something that that suited uh, both Schwab Junior and Schwab Senior? Financially, maybe Schwab Senior can make a bit of money. Well, I'm sure he did. But let's go on. Let us go on indeed. So we've only got a few more. So bear with me. We're on the Philadelphia Daily News. Here we are. Oh, look, there's Frank Sinatra. Oh, blue eyes. He's loved by everyone. And we're going to look down here at Davos, Switzerland, UPI. Economist John Kenneth Galbraith accused President Nixon today of being unable to run a modern economy and predicted he would be a one-term president. Close. One and a half terms. That's pretty close. Galbraith attacked the president's economic policy at a news conference following the address to the European Management Symposium in the Swiss resort. That is Davos. European Management Symposium is the World Economic Forum. So he used his platform as a co-keynote speaker, a joint keynote speaker of the first World Economic Forum, to then go on to attack Nixon, which isn't a surprise. Nixon actually refused to have him on as an economic advisor, but that also isn't a surprise, really. President Nixon has achieved what's believed, uh, what was believed unachievable, namely combined recession with inflation, Galbraith said. I mean that Mr. Nixon will be one of the few one-term American presidents to uphold free enterprise fully under today's conditions is conservative. Galbraith is an econ economic advisor to President Linger, was an economic advisor to President Lyndon B. Johnson, and later served as U.S. ambassador to India. Later served. Eh, eh, no, I'm afraid in Philadelphia news you didn't do. You're in Philadelphia. You're American. You should know this. Galbraith, Lyndon B. Johnson was after JFK. Yeah, Galbraith was served as U.S. ambassador to India for JFK. Do the math. They can't be, and later served as U.S. ambassador to India. So there's a mistake there, Philadelphia Daily News. Um, okay, so that's that's the little piece there. And the, w one of the reasons why this is uh, really important as well, that you understand that there's this, like, Nixon thing happening at the moment, Galbraith does a lot of uh, democratic fundraising back then. He's doing a lot of um, 
staff including that one of the conferences they end up getting locked out by I think Nixon's people I think it's Nixon's people and there's a big hoo-ha and um and all sorts of like issues and there's a lot of that happening at this time a lot of dirty tricks I mean American politics is full of dirty tricks same thing sort of thing happened with uh Truman I believe um when he was up against a socialist candidate and the socialist candidate this was in 1944 I think and the socialist candidate was likely to win and they locked him out uh, a lot of their supporters out so they couldn't vote and then um he got the nomination instead of the socialist candidate so there's a lot of this going on. This is very interesting because it lines up. But at the same time, John Kenneth Galbraith is working with Kissinger, who's on Nixon's team. So it's not like they're immune to working with monsters. They just like to say out loud. He likes, John Kenneth Galbraith likes to project that he want, doesn't want to work with monsters. Okay, so you're doing well. We've got through most of it. This is Davos' first time. We've learned a little bit here and there. Some really interesting information. Now we're going to go and just look at two very short bits. And then we'll have a little discussion, I suppose. But the Daily Telegraph on the 7th of December, 1971. So this was coming up to the second Davos. Now, publicized within the history is that all oh, the first Davos did really well which obviously it did it brought in uh 250,000 pound worth of revenue at least before the event had started which is the equivalent today 1.8 million uh obviously that's good it brought together a lot of heads of petrol and oil and um a lot of the management people which is obviously what they want um but the second year was supposed to be, and is is like when when you hear people talking about it, like Schwab, oh, it was uh, hard. No one wanted to be involved in the second year. You know, it kind of fell flat. But I'm not sure if it necessarily did. Because listen, more than 200 heads of European firms have agreed to take part in the European Management Symposium in Davos, Switzerland. On January the 22nd, it will be organized with the help of Signor Spinelli, a member of the Market Commission. And its purpose is to help big firms to make the most of the market of 300 million customers. Now, the 300 million customers is obviously talking in relation to Europe, the size of Europe, I suppose. Um, but that's not the real aim of what was the European management supposed to that's how they look made it look and eventually it became the World Economic Forum because from the off as we saw in the previous articles there were Japanese contingent there Israelis this wasn't European management this wasn't European management at all this was very globalist from the start um yeah it spun like that you know and in amongst this bit the this, this little bit in this uh daily telegraph europe buys a little and it's got little little pieces but it says about this european management symposium in in um davos and more than 200 heads of european firms agreeing to take part for the 1972 one so that's january 22nd 1972 that would be now it's then um they say that the 1973 Davos went really well. They got limits of growth for Radio Pecci and the Club of Rome in to speak about uh, limits to growth and speak about depopulation. And they famously said the enemy of man, humanity is man itself. So obviously, you know, there's a lot of, of things to be taken from there. But I thought this was extremely interesting because it gives us another name of someone who really helps, Signor Spinelli who uh, we'll be looking into, of course, won't we? But it also shows that 200 heads of European firms, well, that's not just a few. Oh, oh uh, that's quite a, um, a lot of people. And if they they say they're um, spending the same amount of money as the last time, they'd be worth a lot of money. Now, the the thing is, last time, if you actually, it, it, it does seem that the mass don't add up to 250,000. So how they made 250,000 is probably by sponsorship from companies like IBM and others. Uh, I'm not sure they had this sponsorship on the second occasion. And here we go. Let's, I, I'm going to go uh, 
back in time again. This is February 1971. So this is just after the first European Management Symposium. And here, look who you've got here. John Kenneth Galbraith, and they, they tag, tag it. What do they tag it? The long and short of it. Ooh. Okay, that's an accident. So look what we got here. We got John Kenneth Galbraith and Herman Kahn at the first ever Davos at the European Management Symposium having a coffee over some fantastic, what do they look like, croissants? Um, French sort of pastries, Swiss French pastries. And it says, the long and short of it, in the world of economics, in the world economic form as it will eventually be known, Herman Kahn on the left is the short of it, but the splendid little of futuro but has the splendid title of futurologist, which may means he's used to thinking in the long term. Whereas John Kenneth Galbraith on the right stands six foot eight inches tall. They love saying that, but he has recently developed a passion for degrowth. Here are the uh, they are pictured, probably discussing the role of the middleman during the interval in the first European Management Symposium, which was held in Davos in Switzerland and ended this weekend. So, again, it wasn't just a one-day event. There you go. There's Herman Kahn and John Gennett Galbraith, the mentors given by... Uh, Kissinger to Schwab to go back and help launch and be big names for the first European Management Symposium. And for John Kenneth Galbraith, this was easy because he tied it in with the fact that he was teaching at Cambridge University in England for a year as well. Um, so that's extremely interesting. <clears throat> is that it? Is that it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So... That was an interesting one. We've had a little look through space and time, as we normally do. Uh, we had a little look at some of the early European management symposium, World Economic Forum uh, participants, the companies involved. And, we, you know, within that, what you've got to understand, what part of NewsHound is partially doing is that helps you see how you research too because when you go back in time and you're looking at those articles now those articles if i was to research schwab i would have every article that's almost ever been said and i will go through every single article that's ever been published sorry i go through every single one and i will find the answers i'm looking for within sentences within little tiny bits within connections within finding out who's involved with who with names being mentioned with dates that are being mentioned i find pictures and other stories by looking at those dates in the local newspapers or the like um you know there's lots of information to be dragged up from all of that and some of it's really interesting so like the companies who are involved who were meant to be sponsoring it um but also the early sort of um like the front page article about him visiting texas carrot clash visiting texas in 1966 is a little bit weird you know it's not something that uh you 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 necessarily expect to see oh look there's this guy who's a, a engineering student and he's having a conversation with a woman in a airport why is that a story why is that front page news oh his his father has uh has, has got some business with texan petroleum company why is that front page news why is it and a lot of the time these guys are put into the front page you know, it's not front page news. That's how the media work. They put no news in front page and you look at it and say front page news because it's on the front page. They're in control of that. They have control of it. But they're just another corporation who are trying to advertise another message. And, uh, you know, if they want to influence. So if someone wants to influence or get that name out there, they could just pay for that to be stuck on the front page. You don't have to say anything even. He met a woman in the airport. It turned out he lived 60 miles away in a place that he doesn't live. You know, not even the details in it seem completely correct. And there's a few mistakes um, throughout these things. Like John Kenneth Galbraith later being uh, U.S. ambassador to India when he was actually U.S. ambassador to India before. You know, there's lots of little 
errors within it. But once you've got all of the statements from a certain area, that's when era, that's when you've got a lot of like first hand records of um uh, like secondary sources maybe, but first hand accounts of these um big players, these people and what they're doing. And often they let things slip. So they they say a company or they say a name that later on will be written out of history. And I find this on a few occasions. So understanding who Klaus Schwab is, understanding where the World Economic Forum started, what the companies and the people behind the European for um the European management spoke in the World Economic Forum um were doing and why they chose Klaus Schwab is really important to understand where we are now. Because otherwise, if you don't have there, there, and all the bits in the middle, you don't have all the information. And we're looking to have all the information. I'm fed up of, you know, you, you can call uh, people on our area of the independent news fake news. But if we have dotted all, uh, all the I's, crossed all the T's, and we have everything sewn up, then it's impossible to call this fake news. It's, it's one of the reasons why I think I'm targeted less than um, publicly, out loud, than a lot of people in independent media. Um, they just prefer to ignore people like me and Whitney, our work, because our work is checkable, is verifiable. You can go um, to uh, Whitney's uh, book here. Why, why not advertise it? One Nation Under Blackmail, uh, Under Blackmail, Volume 2. And you can go to the end of any chapter. I'm just getting to the end of a uh, chapter or two chapters along. She, this girl knows how to be. And what you'll find is a list of references and notes. And that's not one or two sources here. This is for one chapter. Look, this another page, another page. You know, we we this is what we do. This is what we do. So if you want to see just for the one chapter, that's the resources and sources that you have to look at um and the end notes for each chapter so what we do is we try and make sure we link in everything so we have to look at everything to do that it's you can't be lazy um when i first started being a journalist i was lazy um i wanted everything or oh, first started trying to be a journalist i was lazy i wanted everything uh to come at me and for it to be easy and for me to be like some form of genius who saw things and saw connections, you know, you can only do that if you've got all the information. And what you find is that you can't write an art, a proper article, a proper well-researched article. You can't write it like that. You've got to have time. You've got to develop it. You've got to see all of the information because no doubt you will start on a journey and you will think you have the beginning, middle and end like in your brain as it's going to go but it never goes like that because you find out information that that leads you over here and leads you over here and leads you back here and leads you up there you know you 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 will be thrown about all over the place when you're investigating with all of the information and that's what you want you want to know the truth not a version of your own truth projected out um onto events you don't want to take in only like a third of the information and then say this is everything that there is because it's just not true there's loads to be found out there, loads more. And there's loads of other twists and turns. Other people, I can write an article, other people can come around and say, have you seen this, though, that you could have also put in your article? Often, the people, like the main criticism is, yeah, but you didn't mention this other, these other hundred things that you could have put in your article, too. But an article of 7,500 words is about a specific thing at a specific time. It has to be about that. It has to be accurate about that specific thing at that specific time. You know, so a lot of my articles they go through history, but they they like the Schwab family values where you'll find a lot of the information about this period in history. The first in the Klaus Schwab series. When you look at that, well, uh, it, it 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 shows you Klaus Schwab's father, the company he worked for, how that company rose up, the area that the company was based in, um, how they were helping the Nazis during the war, how Klaus Schwab went on to do the same. Klaus Schwab's, uh, a, a, a brief history of Klaus Schwab's youth and education that can lead you to understand how he ended up being in the same position in the same company as his father, basically the same position, second in command of Escher Weiss, as it was 
I mean, Schultz or Escher Weiss, um, and and uh, eventually Schultz AG, um, and and how they both, uh, so you know, were, were working with uh, authoritarian racist regimes, uh, apartheid regime in South Africa for Schwab and the Nazis for his father Eugen Schwab. How these two were using the same sort of governments to make money um, from weapons of mass destruction. Just after he left the area where all the thinking has changed about weapons of mass destruction, and they think oh, maybe we should proliferate them more, uh, and and we should let them out, uh, let the cat out of the bag, because it'd be a mutually assured destruction, so it ensures no one actually presses a button and fires it in the first place. So that that sort of change happened. Now John Kenneth Galbraith, when we mentioned him here, I mentioned him earlier. You can't underestimate or undervalue this guy. He was also um, uh, Zoo. I've mentioned this in a couple of interviews, but um, Zufika Ali Bhutto uh, contacted John Kenneth Galbraith. He had met him um, back when uh, John uh, JKG, as you could call him, um, when John Kenneth Galbraith was uh, ambassador to India in uh, the early 60s under Kennedy. Zulfika Ali Bhutto had met him and introduced him to his young daughter, Benazir Bhutto. Uh, when it came around to Benazir Bhutto being only 16 years old, Zulfika Ali Bhutto contacted John Gennif Galbraith and said, can you mentor her at Harvard and, and do what you do with the other guys? And he was like, I can't, I don't have the time because he's doing all this stuff by this time. He's he's planning to go to Cambridge and uh, in England and, and do a, a teaching for a year and stuff like that as well so he's an extremely busy guy but he gets his son to mentor uh, Benazir Bhutto who eventually becomes head of Pakistan twice like Prime Minister of Pakistan twice uh, assassinated I mean that's pretty pretty big and uh, and these people these, these people they lift people into to power so they lifted Schwab they lifted Benazir Bhutto into power uh, they lifted Pierre Trudeau into power they lift a lot of people into power and John Kenneth Galbraith is a he he was a big mover and shake I mean he's a man again I'll say it, who taught Joseph Kennedy and um, JFK. Uh, he's the guy who uh, headed up the interrogation for Albert Speer, the head of war armaments. His um, wife had lived with Unity Mitford in Germany uh, before the war, who was Hitler's girlfriend. Um, John Kenneth Galbraith uh, was one of the most important men in history who hasn't been mentioned enough. And if you listen to his speak, you'd fall asleep, of course. But these were all people who were involved in the first ever World Economic Forum at Davos called the European Management Symposium. And I hope that this news hound has given you some extra insight to what that event must have been like, uh, the people who attended it. And um, like I say, you understand how it got created, how it got started, and you understand where we are now. You've got more of a picture than the majority of people out there who are just learning about the World Economic Forum. Because what I've discovered is that over the past six months, everybody suddenly started going, World Economic Forum, go on one of these. And and it's pretty noticeable that they are a, a big deal, a big deal globally. And you've got to be careful. I mean, some of the, the some of the people who are part of this, these are dystopian people. And it was set up via a CIA funded uh, course, funded by CIA conduits. Uh, Kissinger's International Seminar at Harvard, um, and a lot of these people went on um, to to do big things. Harvard at the time, I'm about to bring out an article, huh, which again is saying Harvard, and Harvard at the time was the centre of what you could call um, the what we would call back then the New World Order, and what I call today the Global World Order because it's no longer new. This is the old world order. we got to create a new world order. we got to create a new world order that's about the people and not about these guys deciding what happens. Because uh, these guys have made mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. John Kenneth Galbraith um, may have campaigned against Vietnam, but it seems like he was controlled opposition. So you can't trust him at all. Um, he, he, these people are they did other things as well and we are going to look into them as much as I can and document as much as I can so that's it for the time being that's the news hound that's about Klaus Schwab and the first Davos 
And I hope uh, you took something from it. And uh, join me again next time for News Hound. I'm sure there'll be a few things coming out. I should have, if if all goes well, around six articles coming out over Christmas. Six articles. Can you believe that? Maybe seven. Um, but six articles coming out over Christmas. Uh, and all of them will tackle really interesting things. Um, the the next big one is this one that is basically based in Harvard that I think I think people will really dig, and will make people understand the Ukraine war a little bit better. How we ended up in the situation in Ukraine a little bit better because as always, all of these things start in Harvard. It's quite amazing. So thank you for joining me. I've been Johnny Vedmore. This has been New Newshound. You can find my work on johnnyvedmore.com. You can find it on fungimonkey.com. You can also find uh, it on unlimitedhangout.com uh, where a limited hangout now, if you want to read my Schwab series, there's in a drop-down banner of um, series uh, banner, then you'll find the Schwab series there. And please... Learn as much as you can because these guys are taking over. I've already taken over the world. You've got to work out who your new masters are. They're not very nice people. Enjoy. For the time being, thank you for coming to Newshound. Goodbye. What we know is that we will end up with many more unemployed. Uh...